Uh, so good morning, everybody. Welcome Bonjour, to this talk about the Chinese cinema strand. Uh, my name is Tony Rains. This is Marie-Claire Guo, who is the curator of the selection of films and is also the curator of the private collection in Paris, which, which they come from. And with her is her husband, uh, Mr. Guo Guanlong, uh, who collaborated in all aspects on the, on the event as well. So we're going to start, we have very limited time now. Uh, I'm going to speak second, and I have a, f a couple of film clips to show you, which I think might be of interest to you, uh, from documentaries that I made in the 1980s. Uh, uh, but first we're going to hear from Marie-Claire and Mr. Guo uh, about their collection in Paris, about the selection of films for Bologna, and Chinese cinema generally. So I'm going to hand over right away to Marie-Claire. Uh, I'll speak in English, although my English is not too good, so please excuse me. Um, after the revolution of 68 in France, uh, Chinese was taught in the, in the university but it was already the time of cultural revolution. And there was no link between French university and Chinese authorities at the time. So it was very difficult to teach to the young students who were, who, which, who were coming to the university what was China, not only China of that time, but China. And uh, so we thought it could be a good idea to show them films. We were a group of people who loved film, who were going to Cinémathèque at the time of Henri Langlois, nearly every day, and we had seen many, many films, so we believed in film. And we thought if only the student could see some films, even if they don't understand always the language because it's too difficult for them, they learn about the way of the Chinese, the way of being, of standing, of taking a child in their arms, of eating, of, well, the way the Chinese are. And uh, at that time, we couldn't go to China, so we went to Hong Kong doing research. Myself, I began working in a uh, national research center in, in uh, 60, no, 70, in the year 70. And so each year we would go to Hong Kong to make some research in Hong Kong in New Asia College. And uh, at that time we had a Chinese friend called Chen Xin Ho who knew many people from cinema. And uh, through him we were introduced to very important producers like Wu Xinzai and Tong Yue Chen. That's the most important. Wu Xinzai had been a very, as we have made a, a, a short presentation of Wu Xinzai in the catalog, he has been a very important producer uh, from uh, 1925 to the 70s. And uh, Tong Vision was the wife of uh, Zhang Shan Kun, the head of Xinhua Company, which has been prominent in the 30s. And then uh, after the war, uh, af when the civil war was raging, uh, they came to Hong Kong. So in the beginning, they gave us, each of them gave us some films. <coughs> but after that, we needed more film to show to the student. And we looked for film. At that time in Hong Kong, you could <coughs> find old films that nobody was much interested. Only there were 16 millimeters copies which were shown on TV. But apart from that, nobody was more interested about these old films. And so we could get copies. Every, in the beginning, we, 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 had, we had had some funding for the first film given to us but that we had to pay for the price of the copy. But after that, there was no more money. So we just uh, did it ourselves. And uh, each year we would b buy three copies, about three copies. 
And then the great difficulty was to send them to France. But we were lucky enough to get a very valuable uh, support from Air France, Air France of that time, with people who really believed in culture. And we could even send to France uh, nitrate copies, which were not all easy to, <laughs> to send, even at that time. Uh, and at that time, unfortunately, the English didn't let Hong Kong have a film archive, so there was no film archive. And uh, of course, the mainland people couldn't collect anymore the, the film from Hong Kong. So we were the only one to collect films. And as we, when the film came back to France, each year we would send two or three copies. We would put them in the French film archive, which had been created in the 70s. And uh, so the films were put in the cold, and we collected them before other people would collect them. That's why we have copies which sometimes are in better condition. And slowly by slowly, we made a collection of about uh, more than 100 films. But then later on, some films were destroyed because of vinegar syndrome. And at the time, uh, French film archive wouldn't keep the, uh, the film which had vinegar syndrome. Um, to, by, at the time, I was also, after the opening of, of China in 79, the film came back from mainland China, came back to the Chinese embassy in Paris. And so I, was show, I had a program to show the film in Paris number no. seven university. And so each week, I, I kept a car for that, and each week I would go to the, to the Chinese embassy, get a copy, and we would show it in the university, and then I would send it back, give it back to, to the Chinese embassy. And uh, there it was shown in a big amphitheater. Uh, many people came, especially Chinese people. It was open to anybody who wanted to come and see this film. The film was not subtitled, but even not subtitled, for, for, it's like uh, in the old days in Langua Cinematheque, we have seen so many films which were not subtitled. And uh, as Duche said once in China when I was with him, you look at a film which is not subtitled, you look at it much more carefully, you can discover many things about that film. So we showed the film like that. And uh, there was many, many people came, perhaps two, three hundred each time. So it was, and it lasted, I don't know, perhaps 25 years or something like that. So I have been showing quite a lot of film of the embassy and uh, Chinese embassy in Paris, and they knew my work. And so recently, two years ago, when they were told that uh, the huge reserve of films they had couldn't be kept, and there was no money to send it back to China, um, I had told them to put them in Bois d'Arcy, but they, it was too complicated for them. They didn't want to do it. And so in the end, because we already had a contract with Bois d'Arcy, the, uh, the, the French Film Archive, CNC, uh, they decided to give us all their films. And it was, uh, we, still, it's not, we still don't know the, the last number, but more than 1,000 films. Perhaps, well, I don't know exactly yet because there are still some copies which uh, are problematic. And so now we have a huge amount of film some of them even from the 40s, like uh, Wang Jadanghu, which has been uh, shown yesterday, and another film by the same director, Si Wang Zhantian, which has, has rarely been seen. Myself, I have seen plenty, plenty of films, <laughs> because I first was in China with Marco Muller to choose films, 
And then I was in China to choose film from the Pompidou Center exhibition that we made with Jean-Louis Passec. And so I've seen many, many films, but this one I had never seen. So in that uh, collection, we have very valuable film, especially the film made uh, after the opening, 78, 79, and uh, the 80s, which are very rich, and now nobody knows about them anymore. But very important film made at that time, till the 90s. And also film, film from the Cultural Revolution, which were later given to the embassy, and that uh, we, we collected just as well, as well as film from a China film in Paris when it disappeared, the film was given to the embassy. So all these films are in our hands, but it's a very big responsibility. We have uh, written a letter, contract with, with uh, the embassy. We, ca we can use them for cultural purpose, and we will try to make through them, and our first collection, which has many important films, even sometimes unique copies of these films, we are still trying to make Chinese cinema more well known. But what I feel nowadays that is that the young Chinese don't know about their own cinema because there is, they have no chance to know, it's never shown to them. And um, it's more and more what Kaziragi had written in the 70s, or even in the 60s, Il Cinema Chinese Questo Sconosciuto, Chinese film, it's a Chinese cinema that nobody knows. And it's more true nowadays, I think, that it has been in the 80s when there was a huge interest, and after that, the fifth generation, huge interest in Chinese film. Now, who knows anymore about the great film of Chinese cinema? Bon. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we have chosen, uh, with Tony, we have chosen eight films to give you an idea. All these films are famous films. Of course, the copy not... Only one copy has been restored in BM5, which was very, very beautiful, a spring in a small town. But, but uh, the others have not been restored yet. But uh, like through this film, it's possible to have an idea of the quality of Chinese cinema at the time. I'm afraid to speak too long. So. OK. Well, um do you want to say anything about the specific selection of these eight films? Uh, well, the title, The Rebirth of Chinese Cinema, it's more for the film after 45, after uh, the peace, uh, when the, the people came back to, from Chongqing, the wartime capital came back to, to Shanghai and opened new companies. Some companies belonging to Kuomintang, uh, who was uh, at power at that time, and other free freelance companies like Wenhua and like Kunlun. Kunlun by, uh, animated by the communist people, and Wenhua animated by people who loved culture, but had no no political, to always stayed away from political problems. And so this time is really a time of rebirth. But we have shown another film, which is very rare, that was a good chance. It's a film made in 41, in the Orphan Island time. The Orphan Island is a time between the declaration of, guerre, of war by the Chinese in 37 to, the, to Japan, but in fact the war had lasted from 31 when they invaded Manchuria. But anyway, the war was officially declared in 37. But the Pacific War only began in December 41, after Pearl Harbor. And so 
the, the, the foreign concession in Shanghai, the international concession and the French concession were, were still at peace, or so-called peace, because the Chinese city of Shanghai was already occupied by the Japanese, and the Japanese were present in the international concession, so the situation was quite difficult with them. But anyway, the French concession was a bit more uh, at peace. So that's where that film could be, could be prepared. And of course, as Tony said in his presentation, the presence of the war is very, very powerful. And uh, the, the intention of the Chinese to, to fight to, to recover the country, which was so badly attacked. And uh, so there was, the film is full of messages, of course, uh, and even the famous song, song of uh, the Piggy, of Piggy, uh, Zhu Badie, who, which was a patriotic song, and everybody in Shanghai was listening at that song on the radio, because it was radio days, and uh, everybody would sing it. In each family, people would sing it. But in the end, when the pressure of the Japanese after Pearl Harbor was too strong, just the time the film was shown, uh, they were so afraid uh, that they cut, they cut the song. But all the rest was there, and the film uh, is still very beautiful, the first film, perhaps in Asia, which had such a level of uh, of workmanship, uh, because uh, the made only by the two twins, the third the third uh, brother, in fact, was in Chongqing, and uh, but uh, when they when they made it, uh, it was already the first film in China, the first long lens film in China and in Asia. And uh, even the Japanese film were not at that level. So that's why Tezuka Osamu, which we saw the film, which was shortly shown in Japan, decided to become, to, to, to himself become an animator big after he's seen his film. And in the 80s, he came back to Shanghai, and he asked to meet Wang Laming. And he said that, Wang Laming, you are my master. <laughs> so that's the story of the first one, which, which is a bit made in 41, not at after the war. And then one which has been made in Hong Kong, which is very important because lots of people from, uh, from mainland China came back to came to Hong Kong after the war because in mainland China the the situation was very very difficult especially after civil war broke between uh, Kuomintang and and the uh, communists and uh, so in Shanghai there was no work as you the one who have seen the film yesterday it tells about that story no work the people didn't know how to survive and so many of them went to, Shang to Hong Kong where they could find work. And some of them stay, some of them came back to China after 49. But uh, when the communist uh, regime was settled by Mao, but uh, some others uh, stayed in Hong Kong where they, they were doing uh, cinema in Mandarin which was uh, the language of many refugees from mainland at that time, from everywhere around China. So it's, it's, but it's made by very famous people from uh, Chinese cinema in the 30s, like uh, Fei Mu and Zhu Shilin and many others. Well, look, since you've spoken about Princess Iron Fan, uh, maybe this is the moment to look at my, the first film clip I brought. Um, in the 1980s, when Channel 4 television in Britain was uh, a rather more progressive institution than it now is, um, I was commissioned to make some documentaries on Chinese cinema, and I made several. 
Uh, one of them is a short piece about Shanghai Animation Studio. And while putting this together, it, the, the whole thing is only about 20 minutes, but obviously we can't show all of it now. Uh, but while putting it together, we came upon in the National Film Archive in London a short film called Popular Chinese War Songs, made in 1938. As Marie Claire has just explained, uh, Shanghai, much of Shanghai, uh, fell to the Japanese in 1937. At that point, a lot of Chinese, including many in the film industry, evacuated from the city and went up the Yangtze River to inland areas. They went first to Wuhan, later to Chongqing, uh, going further and further west along the river. Um, the Wan brothers, the pioneer animators, who'd done extraordinary work for feature films during the 1930s in China, uh, were amongst the refugees who fled the city. Uh, and in Wuhan in 1938, they made, or they contributed to these short films for the war effort to boost, uh, resist, to boost resistance to the Japanese. Um, and they made this very tiny, it's only two minutes long, this little animation uh, to show the Chinese scholar rising from his books, a man of peace, a man of culture, rising from his books, drawing his traditional sword to fight off the marauding samurai from Japan. So why don't we pause for a moment and just look at this very short piece of animation from the Wan brothers from 1938. If I can add something, it's yeah. a very, very precious film, very short, but has been kept by National Film Archive in London. If it doesn't exist even in China, and the Chinese don't even know about it. <laughs> okay. okay. So. Let's just see it. So, uh, the first clip, please. If, if I may add a word about, huh? about that film. The, the, the personage you see there is Yue Fei, a famous hero from the Song Dynasty. And the, the, the words of the song are, the river is red with blood. A terrible song. Yes. Uh, and very, very dear to the Chinese. Yes. So after making this, uh, the Wan brothers returned to Shanghai to the Orphan Island, as Marie Claire explained, uh, where they made Princess Iron Fan, uh, which was their first long, long film, feature length film. So, um, uh, Mr. Paul, anything you want to add at this point? Yeah, I just want to say something about CDCC, the, the Centre de Documentation mm -hmm. sur le Cinema Chinois. As I'm, I'm the president, so I want you, it's like, uh, it's like the Chinese oh. film. Closer to the microphone. It's like the Chinese film is seldom known. So our, our, our centre, which is a small centre, the documentation, uh, with, a, with a small collection, which now we start with a small collection. I remember with Marie Claire, we went to Hong Kong in the, 19th, in the early 1970s. We start collecting the films with uh, some friends. Hong Kong at that time is not as, pro as prosperous as now. It's before, it was before the economic takeoff. So many things are very, I would say, uh, it's a sort of cottage industry, uh, many cottage industry. Besides, we got these two collections of film from Mr. Wu Xingzai and Tong Yuezhen. We find a certain Mr. Miao who distribute all Chinese film to the to Southeast Asia. Uh, everybody knows there are a lot of Chinese there, and they they sort of uh, show this film in the television, local televisions. So he has lots of prints. So when we get into contact with him, he has a small office in Jin Sato area, and then he has this laboratory, which is a cottage industry, really on the rooftop 
Uh, very simple equipments with uh, barrels of acid and for, de uh, for de developing the films. I don't know, chemicals, yes. So I remember with Marie Claire, we used to go up, climb the stairs, and to, to look at the prints. And there are so many of them. It's a treasure for us to find this place. And uh, of course, uh, later on, we even bought a seven, 16 millimeters camera uh, project, projector to look at the films. So from there, we get a big collection for, uh, for our, for our uh, center. So the, the, the center was uh, reorganized in 1979. Uh, we don't have any finance, uh, no financial means anymore because before it was subvention by the university. So it's uh, that time I remember Marie Claire used to project certain films in the university, Paris set in the university. At the beginning it was always free. Then later say we have no means of getting money to buy new films. So we start asking the people coming to contribute one franc, two franc, which is nothing. But since there, there were a lot of people coming, most of them are Chi overseas Chinese working, working uh, in Paris. And little by little, we have some money. We bought uh, every year a little bit more and more. And our collection was constituted well before the Hong Kong I archive exists. And then, uh, so we get some of the prints which are still in better condition. Later, the Hong Kong Film Archive will give the name of this Mr. Mel, who sold us these films for a very cheap price. For a 16 millimeter prints, it costs about 400 Hong Kong dollars. Well, that, that period was still, at that period, still uh, not so cheap, but it was cheap. So f from there on, uh, due principally to Marie Claire, I was working somewhere else in Switzerland. <laughs> so Marie Claire was taking over uh, all the, almost the whole, whole center. It's almost alone in, in constituting these films. So we participate as early as 1982 in the Torino Festival of Marco Muro, which was the first big festival on Chinese cinema. Uh, and then in 1982, some of the films shown in the Torino Film Festival, we show it in the Pagoda Cinema in Paris, which is nice theater if you ever go to Paris. And then in 1984, Marie Claire with uh, Jean-Luc Passac, they have this big Chinese retro, uh, uh, retrospective on Chinese cinema in Centre Pompidou. And then afterwards, we have uh, some other, uh, we went to some other small film festival, no, not uh, in Montpellier, in Nantes, and uh, we also start very early with uh, animation films. As early as uh, 1985, we, the, we went to the Annecy International Film Animation Film Festivals, where the copy of Princess Iron Fan was restored and shown for the first time. And then, uh, of course, we collaborated with uh, uh, La Vie de Paris and the uh, uh, Chinese Cultural Center in Paris to show some other animation films. Last year, China was honored as a guest, as a guest of, as a guest of honor in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Film International Film Festival. Uh, we were invited. Marie Claire was there. He curated four programs out of eight on Chinese animation films. So now we, we have a, a more than 1,200 titles in our collection, which is quite uh, considerable, uh, considering that uh, 
I, I suppose it's one of the most important collection in Europe. And among that, we have one of, a few made by not Chinese directors, but by uh, foreigners. It is Auguste François, uh, which is uh, a contemporary of Le, Le Frère Rimier, Rimier Brothers. He, sh he was a diplomatic at that time in China. He made some film, documentary films on China. It's around what time? In it? In Then we also have the, the film of Julius Evans on China, 400 millions of Chinese, which is very precious. Millions, huh? 400 mm. millions. Mm. Huh? millions. Mm. Which was given to the embassy. Yes. Mm. So we got it through the embassy. This, this is just a little bit about our center. And we need a lot of help from other people also we looking for help. Okay. Well, my, my involvement came, uh, just to complete this picture, in the late 70s, soon after Mao's death, when the Chinese embassy in Britain invited uh, the BFI to organize a Chinese film week. And the BFI came back and said that there happened to be one person in the BFI uh, by the name of Scott Meek, who said we could surely do something better than a film week and came back to the embassy with a proposal that instead we make a research trip to China and try to organize some kind of retrospective of Chinese cinema. And knowing of my interest in Chinese cinema, Mr. Meek contacted me and invited me to join him in a research trip. So my first trip to China was in the late 70s and uh, it was quite frustrating because at that time the China Film Archive was still closed. It had closed down during the Cultural Revolution and had not yet reopened. So we had a meeting with archive people, but they were very apologetic and said, we haven't yet opened the, the archive deposit. We don't know what prints are there. All our records were destroyed in the Cultural Revolution. Uh, we have no, we're, we're not ready to receive anybody yet, and we certainly not in a position to lend any copies to anyone. So we had to piece together what we could from uh, other sources. Uh, we found very little in Beijing, but we found more in Shanghai. So in Shanghai, the, the, it turned out that the studios had kept copies of some of the pre-war classics, including uh, some of these films from the 19, late 1940s. So it was possible for us to see one or two 30s classics, but also some late 40s classics. And to, in fact, to still meet some of the people who made them. Um, and we put on a retrospective at the National Film Theatre in London in 1980, uh, a little bit before Muller's event in Torino. Uh, and that attracted attention from, amongst others, Marco Muller, also from Marie Claire. We first had contact at that time. Uh, and uh, we did the best we could to mount a retrospective of Chinese cinema uh, in the absence of the primary sources, uh, that's to say the Beijing Film Archive. Um, <clears throat> uh, and we followed it in 1985 with a much, much larger retrospective uh, using, we did use prints from the archive and from other sources too. Uh, so that, that's the mini history of what happened in London, for what it's worth. But it was because of those events that I was able to make these documentaries for British television. They were obviously related in the minds of the cultural commissars at Channel 4. So uh, can I just say that for me, uh, just from a pure, purely personal perspective, for me the discovery of Chinese cinema was a very important and interesting thing. I, was, I became conscious when I started visiting Hong Kong, which is a little earlier uh, in the 70s, uh, that Chinese cinema was substantially unknown. The, the, the great explosion internationally of Hong Kong martial arts films was really the first time ever that Chinese film had been widely circulated around the world, any Chinese film. Uh, we discovered after much research that there were odd films that had had screenings in the West, mostly to support the Chinese war effort against the Japanese. Popular Chinese war songs is a good a case in point. Uh, that's why it ended up, I think, in the National Film Archive. It must have been shown uh, in London in 38 or 39, I mean, around that time. And in the second clip, which I'm going to show you in a moment, 
uh, from another documentary that I made in the early 1980s, 1983. Uh, you will see a clip from another film called Tian Lun. Uh, in English, it was renamed Song of China. Uh, that was, it's, it's made by Fei Mu, the director of Spring in a Small Town, uh, in collaboration with his producer. And uh, it's kind of an interesting film, I think. It's a, it's a late silent. Um, it's, uh, and that also was rediscovered in London in a cut-down version, a version running about uh, 40, 45 minutes. Uh, we've subsequently found a longer copy in America, so it was definitely shown there as well. Now, these are cases of films that were exported in the 1930s and must have had some kind of limited screenings at that time, although I haven't been able to uncover any specific records of how and where they were shown. But uh, in the 1970s, it was the case that no mainland Chinese film had had proper international exposure. They were not routinely seen in festivals. They were not invited to festivals. Almost nobody in China, I think, had any knowledge of how to deal with festivals or even how to subtitle in most cases. So the opportunities for export of Chinese films were extremely limited. Um, and uh, the cinema of the 1930s, 1940s remained largely unknown. Uh, and the, the only text in Western language that, that was uh, beginning to explore this heritage was Jay Lyder's book, Dian Ying. Uh, he was invited to, he was an American communist who was invited to uh, the Beijing Film Archive to help them catalog their Russian collections because he was a fluent Russian speaker and an expert in Soviet cinema. Uh, he, he took every opportunity while he was in Beijing to see Chinese films when they were screened at the archive, but he didn't speak or read Chinese. So he made enormous misunderstandings of what he was seeing, and he was able to bring very limited background knowledge of, of uh, what was happening around the films at the time the films were made, and he made some very questionable judgments. His book is full of uh, many mistakes, I would say an average of three major mistakes per page, but uh, nonetheless it's a heroic effort to, to establish a kind of history of Chinese cinema in a Western language, uh, really for the first time, I think. And then there were French communists who also uh, pursued this line. There's a man called Regis Bergeron, I remember, who was a, a loyal servant of the Communist Party in Beijing, uh, who produced, a th I think, three-volume history of Chinese cinema in French. So uh, these initiatives started to take shape, but uh, in, it was uh, David Robinson, who is actually at this festival, I don't think in this room right now, um, uh, published a book in the 70s called World Cinema, which is a great doorstop of a book. It's a, it's a fine book, an attempt at a synoptic history of world cinema. But in that book, Chinese cinema gets precisely one mention, and it's in a bracket. It's not even the subject of the sentence that it appears in. It's a, it's a glancing reference. And that's because David knew nothing about Chinese cinema. It's not his fault. He'd, he'd had no access to Chinese cinema. But that was typical of the, of the plight faced by Western film scholars. Nobody knew anything about this stuff because nobody had ever seen it. Uh, very few people had ever seen anything from China. So uh, it, I, it became clear <coughs> to me that there were enormous gaps to fill. Chinese film history stretches back to the 19-teens, 1920s. Uh, it became clear that Shanghai in the 1930s, which was a, a wonderful young film industry. The average age of directors in Shanghai in the early 30s was about 24. And they were all young people fired up, in a few cases by Western education, in other cases just by the May 4th movement, who were determined to deal with social topics, with urgent uh, political topics, uh, urgent philosophical topics, uh, all kinds of things, in fact, which they felt needed to be put on the agenda of Chinese culture. And it produced a very dynamic and lively film culture, it seems to me. Uh, absolutely worth exploring. I'm not saying that all films made in the 1930s in China were masterpieces, far from. But there are lots and lots of really interesting, exciting films which remain exciting if you see them now. And I hope there will be chances to see them in places like Bologna in the future. Um, I'd like to break now because I want to give us time to have a, a couple of questions, if you have any. Uh, and show my other film clip. This is uh, from, as I said, from another documentary I made in 1983 
called Cinema in China, and it's, uh, it was an attempt to present in one hour uh, a picture of a, a, a tiny synopsis of Chinese film history, but also a perspective on the importance of cinema in Chinese culture. Um, this particular clip, it runs about five minutes, it contains a number of people who were associated with the films you've seen here this week. So that's why I chose it. Uh, at the very beginning, you will have a brief glimpse of a filmmaker called Sun Yu, uh, whose films are not in this program, but who was uh, that, uh, he's now dead, sadly. In fact, everybody who appears in this is now dead, I think. Uh, but uh, uh, he was a key figure in 1930s cinema who later had very serious trouble politically. Uh, you will see him with Shen Fu, the director of Lights of 10,000 Homes, which some of you saw yesterday. Um, he's talking, Shen, Shen Fu is talking here mostly about a film he co-scripted uh, a couple of years after Lights of 10,000 Homes, a film called Crows and Sparrows, which I think is the best of the Kunlun productions, uh, and made right on the cusp of the communist victory in 1949. Uh, you will then see a little clip from along the Sungari River, and a short interview with Zhang Ruifang, who is the uh, young heroine in that film, who, as I said at the introduction that day, went on to become a grand dame of Chinese cinema, Chinese communist cinema. And in between, there's a little glimpse of the Fei Mu film that I mentioned earlier, this film Tian Lun, known as Song of China, uh, and a short interview also with its cinematographer, a, a, a very wonderful gentleman called Huang Xiaofen. So if, you, if we can take five minutes, let, I'd like to show you this little clip, this little montage of uh, people and films from the 1930s. We have time for just one question. If anybody has a quick question they'd like to ask us, uh, we'll do our best to answer it briefly. Yes, please, a hand. Thank you. About the CDC archives, sorry, about the CDC archives, mm. um, is there a published catalogue? Is it online? And are there any facilities for research in? No, we have not made a catalogue yet. And, but now that the collection has been, is, is so big, we really want to do a catalogue. And we want to do a catalogue a little bit like the work we have done in Pompidou Center with Jean-Louis Passec, with a presentation of the film, explanation, a very short presentation of the film, explanation of the meaning of the film, the problem the, the film might have, all what, what is, which is hidden and people cannot understand right away. And then notices about the cinematographer, about, about the directors, and one part on local history to make the link between the films and the history of the time. So it is, it is a huge work, and we have people to do it. But the problem is that we have no funding at all. And ourselves, we are not rich enough. We, can, we, we are already using our own money, but uh, uh, because uh, the association, because we have Chinese things, and so, uh, not, so many, no many people know about, know the value of it. And uh, we have been working very hard on subtitles to, so that people can understand better. But it is a huge work and it takes lots of time. Uh, this year from, uh, from this festival, I have made the subtitles of two films, but it takes lots of time and it's, it's, it's difficult. It's not easy to do it. Anyway, we do our best, but we really need to get some help from outside. Uh, it's difficult, and that's one reason why we are so 
grateful to Bologna, to Gianluca to Farinelli, to have accepted to show some of our films here in Bologna, so that more people would know about it. And I have had also a contact with Victor Mer, who is the head of uh, Lausanne Cinematheque and the head of FIAF, the actual head of FIAF, and I hope we can work with FIAF as well so that more people know about that fund of film. And in fact, we must work with other cinematech, like uh, Mr. Costa in Portugal, perhaps with the Belgian, cin uh, uh, the Belgian cinematech, uh, Royal Cinematech, because they have film also, and some other films are kept in Vienna, where we have funds, and uh, in, uh, in Deutschland as well. And so I think if somebody would be interested at the time, it would be very important that the European make a catalog with the British as well, but uh, I have been said that uh, there, there are not many people, many, many films in the National Film Archive, but still there are some. Uh, so, if all the resources of the Chinese cinema in Europe could be well known and more research work done on it, more publishing, uh, then it would be better known and it's a very important way to understand China of nowadays and of before. Because if you don't understand what happened before, there are many things of today's which can't be understood. That's true. We have to stop, uh, so sorry. Uh, uh. I want to ask to add just one word. Okay. Because uh, Tony talked about what happened in England and in the States. But in fact, to be really fair, the Italians have done research ah. and the French too. And many things have been published. There is, especially by example, there is a world cinema by Einaudi, to which I, cont I know because I contributed for the film for the, 40th, the 40s. But, uh, and in France, the catalogue we made with Jean-Louis Passec was uh, very... Of course, it is in French, but uh, still, uh, we, we talk about many things. And then, because Passec had, was working with La Rousse, Lots of, of the work made at that time was used later on in La Rousse, a dictionary of cinéastes. So, in fact, in France and Italy, work has been done. And the problem is that is a problem of languages <laughs> to well, go from one to have more more exchanges between the people who have the same interest. Well, that, that's undoubtedly true, but it's also sadly true that that it was a very very minority thing, even in France. The, French people I discussed things French Chinese cinema with seem to be very ignorant of all those sources. So it's, it, I think it's uh, you know the work is international and the work is yeah, it's, it's undoubtedly true though that we need more cross fertilization between the cultures. I agree with it. We have to make way for the exciting DVD awards, which is going to take place in here in just a minute. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, big thank you to Marie Claire and Mr. Four. Uh, and uh, hope to see you again doing more Chinese cinema in Bologna. And a Thanks. big thank you to you.